Hello and welcome, I'm Yuan Castell and you're watching We on Wings. Today we will show you how life can be working as a helicopter pilot on an idyllic tourist island in Australia. New and quirky art exhibits and museums across the world and how Delhi gears up to host the G20 Summit next month. First up, let's take a trip to Australia's Victoria to see what it's like to fly a helicopter over one of the state's iconic tourist islands. Let's take off. The city of Melbourne is as scenic as it is diverse. From the fabled sports stadiums to its historic markets. Melbourne doesn't shy away from dishing up a spectacular visitor experience. Venturing out of the city, the road takes us through the beautiful scenery of the countryside of Victoria. After crossing the only bridge leading to Phillip Island, the first stop is at Phillip Island Helicopters, where I'm meeting helicopter pilot Chad, who is taking me for a ride and shows me the route. Before being allowed to take off, I must sign a liability waiver. I also get a safety briefing. It's very important with helicopters that we always approach and depart from the front of the helicopter. Yeah. We don't want to go anywhere near the danger at the back, right. so pretty much from the back doors onwards. Uh, that's where you'll find the hot exhaust and spinning tail rotor. Yeah. Uh, when we head out there, stand by one of either myself or one of the boys. Mm. Uh, we will always operate your doors for you. Uh, I will be showing you how to use your door in case of emergency. Uh, highly unlikely, it's just like, oh, your exit rows. Mm. Uh, and if there is an emergency, it's only ever on the ground, okay? So no one's opening their, help, their doors mid-flight. Time to jump into the chopper and get started. Chad tells me we can remove the door as long as I don't stick my hand outside. More on that later. But before moving, Chad tells me how the instruments and procedures work. So we sit at 55 feet above sea level. Uh, this yeah. is my airspeed indicator. So airspeed will be different to ground speed depending where the wind's coming from. Yeah. I have an engine RPM and a rotor RPM. I'll tell you why there's two in a second. Yeah. Uh, my VSI, so how high or how low and how quickly I'm doing it. And this is my manifold pressure, so that's how much power I'm using from the engine. Mm. The small helicopter is very light and nimble, and as the rotors pick up speed, everything is moving, and before we know it, we're airborne. Phillip Island is located around 140 kilometers southeast of Melbourne. This idyllic small island is home to many adventure activities and is most famous for its penguin parade. Chad takes me over the island points of interest, including a shipwreck that is half submerged. The main town, Cowes, has its tree-lined main street stretching up from the jetty, where the boat tours depart from. From this helicopter ride, we can see the lay of the land and also get a bird's eye view of things we can explore once we're back on terra firma. We pass seal rocks where thousands of seals congregate a popular spot for boat tours. The beautiful landscape with cultivated farmlands dramatically meets the Bass Strait. Picturesque cliffs are interspersed by pristine beaches along the island's south side. And we fly over the island's Grand Prix circuit, which was home to Australia's first Grand Prix. 
This brief time in the air has made me reflect on what a fantastic lifestyle it must be to have a job like Chad's. Just checking out some of the sights we've seen from above every now and then and going surfing when you want to, it seems like a slow and peaceful way to live on this south-facing Australian island. India holds the presidency for the G20 this year, and New Delhi will be in the world's spotlight when the groups meet here next month. Let's look at the renovated Pragati Maidan complex used for the forum. The national capital is on a beautification drive once again. What is the reason? The city is gearing up to host the G20 meetings, as India has taken on the presidency this year. The theme is Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, or One Earth, One Family, One Future. This year's G20 working group's agenda will also focus on agriculture, anti-corruption, culture, digital economy, disaster risk reduction, development, education, employment, environment and climate sustainability, energy transitions, health, trade and investment and tourism. Delhi is now filled with hoardings and electronic displays as the city prepares for the G20 summit scheduled to take place in September this year. Participation in Delhi is palpable as the city prepares to welcome leaders from around the world for the G20 summit. From road upgrades to beautification projects to demolition drives, more than 20 agencies of the central and Delhi governments are working full throttle to revamp the city. Preparations are in full swing to accommodate the leaders and delegates. Security has been heightened and traffic diversions are in place to ensure the smooth movement of VIP convoys. Pragati Maidan's chosen venue has transformed into a diplomacy and discussion hub. The historic venue has undergone a stunning transformation, showcasing India's commitment to hosting a world-class event. The newly inaugurated convention complex at Pragati Maidan has been named Bharat Mandapam. The complex now boasts state-of-the-art conference facilities, spacious exhibition halls and advanced technology infrastructure to ensure seamless communication among the G20 attendees. The new and modern menu looks impressive and promises to provide a conducive environment for crucial discussions on global economic challenges. The world's attention will soon be focused on New Delhi, where leaders will engage in discussions that could shape the course of international economics. We are in Asia's first open-air arts district in New Delhi's Lodi colony. And just like the mural right behind me, there are many murals in this area that are painted by both Indian and international artists. Let us now take you around the world's quirky art and museum exhibits from North America to Down Under. In Montauk, New York, at the Feltz Bagels Bakery, an unconventional twist takes place. The bagels are crafted entirely from felt. With a range of 13 varieties, customers can choose from meticulously hand sewn options in classic form or creatively filled with iconic New York flavors. These selections include a rainbow bagel, complemented by salt beef and onions, or even an everything bagel brimming with pastrami and pickles. When you come into Feltz Bagels, you have a choice of 13 different bagels and you can put whatever you want into it. So here I have an everything bagel. And down here we have all the fillings. So you can have salt beef, you have American cheese, pickles, Swiss, maybe some lettuce. So we'll put that in. Maybe we'll have some 
beef in there. And some onions. They like sticking, sticking together. They're not the easiest. And there is your very own signature bagel. And all together, with all the bagels and the fillings, there are 2,300,000 different combinations that are possible. Stepping into the bakery, one encounter bins filled with impeccably crafted felt replicas of bagels, croissants and breads appearing almost lifelike from a distance. Meticulously handcrafted, the installation took the artist eight months to complete. Visitors to the exhibition can purchase any displayed items, simulating the experience of a regular bakery. The Felt's Bagels experience is accessible to the public at the TW Fine Art Gallery and will be open until September 4th in Montauk, New York. Beneath the iconic Colosseum in Rome, a newly unveiled exhibition offers a unique glimpse into history, revealing the ancient passage used by gladiators to journey from the gymnasium to the arena. This passage, known as the Cryptoporticus, is now accessible to the public for the first time. Along this historic route, a treasure trove of valuable artifacts and meticulously crafted replicas paint a vivid narrative of the gladiatorial world. Federico Rinaldi, the exhibition's curator, accentuates the profound thrill of standing in the very footsteps that gladiators trod over two millennia ago. Allora, la mostra... The exhibition is about the Cryptoporticus, which in antiquity connected the Colosseum with the gymnasium district, especially with the gladiator training school. The added value of our exhibition is that it is in the very places where gladiatorial activities took place. Chibuike Ifedilichukwu, a talented artist hailing from Nigeria, crafts portraits using an ingenious medium, woven aluminium beverage cans. His artistic journey finds its roots in his upbringing. He learned the art of weaving raffia strings into sleeping mats from his grandmother. As he went to university, he took his craft further by incorporating beverage cans. Ifedili Chukwu commences his creative process by meticulously cutting beverage cans into the desired size. Determined by the envisioned artwork, he begins by weaving a foundational canvas and then intricately incorporates the colored segments to yield the desired patterns and portraits. The creation of a single piece of this art can require anywhere from 200 to 1000 beverage cans, depending on the artwork's size and complexity. The artistry of Ifedili Chukwu has garnered attention, with some pieces fetching prices as high as a thousand US dollars, attributed in part to their durability and longevity. The work is, uh, is a lifetime piece because one is produced with a metal aluminium, which has a, a long lifespan, and that of plastic, which we know that it has a, a duration of close to 100 to 200 years to decay. His impact extends beyond individual sales, as he has actively participated in more than 30 group exhibitions. His work has earned him accolades for his efforts in environmental conservation. Excitingly, he is poised to showcase his creations in an upcoming exhibition in London later this year. Drawing inspiration from the enchanting forest, Marianne Dubuis is revitalizing the age-old Swiss craft of paper cutting, skillfully shaping intricate scenes that mirror her emotions and narrate life's tales. In her work, Dubuis masterfully interlaces contemporary elements with tradition, skillfully crafting depictions of modern-day Switzerland. 
A notable example is her 2021 creation showcasing international organizations such as the UN and Red Cross based in Switzerland. Her artistic endeavors have garnered global attention, spanning various nations. Presently, her creations grace the galleries of the Swiss Paper Cutting Center in Chateau d'Eau, situated in western Switzerland, where they remain on exhibit until September 6th. Her lifelong devotion to paper cutting commenced in her formative years. Currently, she dedicates approximately six hours each day to her craft. Within her home studio in Chateau d'Eau, Nestled in the Pays and Haut region, where the Swiss paper cutting tradition originated around two centuries ago. Dubuis demonstrates her artistry. Armed with scissors or a precision cutter, she meticulously shapes intricate scenes, drawing inspiration from the adjacent woods and the individuals she encounters. Paper cutting originated in Asia and came to Europe during the 17th century. The FIFA Museum within Sydney's Fan Festival was revealed to the press just a day before the commencement of the Women's World Cup. And if you are in Sydney for the finals taking place this weekend, make sure you also check out this museum. Positioned at the Fan Festival in Tumbalong Park, Sydney, the FIFA Museum showcases artifacts from previous tournament editions. Moving on, it is time for the latest travel, tourism and aviation updates for those who are looking for the best experiences. Please take a look at our news deck. Japan's main island faced the impact of a tropical storm this Tuesday, delivering forceful gusts and heavy rains that surged rivers and triggered landslide alerts. Despite being downgraded from a typhoon, Lan made a formidable entry from the Pacific towards commercial centers like Osaka and Kobe. Its onslaught included wind speeds up to 144 km per hour, torrential rainfall and towering waves. Lan struck Honshu, the main island, close to 5 a.m. local time in Wakayama Prefecture, about 600 km west of Tokyo, reported the Japan Metrological Agency. Anticipated rain totals of 35 centimeters loomed within 24 hours by Wednesday morning. Power outages affected around 50,000 households across seven regions, while local trains, flights and express services were temporarily halted. Japan Airlines and ANA collectively cancelled over 550 flights. Non-mandatory evacuation advisories were extended to more than 180,000 Wakayama, Kyoto and Nara residents. The storm was projected to linger throughout Tuesday before moving towards the Sea of Japan. Egypt has embraced over 7 million tourists in 2023, marking substantial progress towards its target of 15 million visitors this year. The nation's recent achievements are striking, especially as it emerges from the pandemic's impact on its thriving tourism sector. In the fiscal year 21 to 22, tourist numbers escalated by over 46%, reaching nearly 12 million compared to 8 million in the prior year. Revenues surged impressively by 121% to $10.7 billion, with Europeans comprising over 60% of visitors and Arabs at 26%. These promising trends continued in the first half of this year. Egypt witnessed a 35% rise in tourists, projecting an industry resurgence. The country aims to draw in twice as many tourists yearly by 2028, fostering investment and expanding hotel capacity from 215,000 to 500,000 rooms. Virgin Galactic achieved a significant milestone, propelling its inaugural tourists to the cusp of space on Thursday. Notable among the passengers is former British Olympian John Goodwin, who secured his ticket for $200,000 almost two decades ago. Today the ticket price is $450,000. 
but not for the sweepstakes winners, Caribbean mother-daughter pair Keisha Shahaf and her daughter Anastasia Mayers, who got the experience for free. After a brief flight granting moments of weightlessness, the space plane gracefully glided back to a runway at Spaceport America in New Mexico's desert. While this marks Virgin Galactic's seventh space voyage since 2018, this is the maiden one with a ticket holder. With around 800 people awaiting their turn, the journey is set to continue. Richard Branson's enterprise anticipates offering monthly space plane trips, entering the domain of space tourism alongside Blue Origin and SpaceX. Peruvian coastal towns, heavily reliant on tourism, grapple with financial strains due to successive severe weather events, including El Nino-induced scorching temperatures, droughts and intense rains. El Nino, a natural climate oscillation originating in the tropical Pacific Ocean, has led to adverse impacts. Following destructive floods in March, Punta Hermosa, a prominent seaside resort near Lima, is struggling to regain its vitality, facing reduced visitors and resident migration due to unfavorable weather. Peruvian government reports released in July disclosed that nearly 800,000 individuals have been affected by storms and floods this year. The adverse weather damaged around 300,000 homes and 250,000 hectares of crops. Seawater temperature in the western Peruvian waters is currently 3.4 degrees Celsius higher than the local average, exacerbating the situation. To counter El Nino's impacts, the government has allocated approximately $1.09 billion for enhancing emergency rescue equipment and infrastructure. Lingkang City in southwest China's Yunnan province owes a significant boost in tourism to the lively festivities of the Yi Ethnic Group's Torch Festival. Revered as the Orient Carnival, this traditional event holds profound cultural importance, acting as a vibrant highlight in the Yi Ethnic Group's calendar. Drawing enthusiastic crowds, participants engage in spirited chanting and dancing around campfires. Historically, these fires served the dual purpose of fending off pests and symbolizing triumph over adversity. Torches laden with symbolic significance embody the victory of humanity over natural challenges and malevolent forces. Beyond the bonfire revelry, the Torch Festival fosters heartfelt expressions of gratitude, an enduring tradition that resonates across generations. That's all we have for you on the show today, but we'll return again next weekend. For now, it's me, Johan Castell, signing off. Goodbye.